Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Lich of Palo Vida. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, which is the five key steps to securing your intellectual property in the open source tornado. Um, my name is Jeff Lush. I'm the founder and head of professional services for Palomita. Uh, started Palomita back in 2004, actually about 10 years this week. Uh, Palomita has been helping companies detect and manage their use of open source. So it's been a, a long, long, uh, fulfilling time, and we're very happy to uh, work with people such as yourselves to basically help you uh, find and use open source correctly and safely. I, I have the pleasure of introducing Amanda Brock who is going to be our, our webinar speaker today. She is the Director of Origin International Technology Law. She has basically over, almost 20 years of global legal experience. Uh, she spent 13 years working in-house advising some of the UK's best known and most innovative companies. This has included General Motors, DSG International, FreeServe, The French Connection, uh, Nicole Fry, and Canonical. Um, she's worked across the US, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So today's webinar is to provide an introduction to legal professionals and software managers that basically help you understand the, the beginnings and basics of open source, uh, an introduction to auditing and audit practices, and also provide a venue to ask any questions. So at the end of the session, we'll do a, a short Q&A. And if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a, a place you can type in questions. So at the, at the end of the webinar, we will look at these questions and ask whatever's there. So um, uh, please please type it there. And if you have any technical problems or anything like that, please let us know as well. We'll be watching the, the, the Q&A site. So with this, uh, I'll turn it over to Amanda. But first, I want to thank everyone for um, answering our questionnaire. We got some really good information about what people are looking for in webinars. And we, we've used that in this webinar as well as our, as our future ones. So thank you very much for taking that time as well as taking the time to work with us today and, and, and listen in. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn this over to Amanda and uh, start the session. OK, can I check everybody that you can see my slides? Yeah. Yes, Amanda. I, yes, we can see your slides. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff, and congratulations on your 10th anniversary. I didn't realize that. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. As Jeff said, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm a lawyer practicing out of London in a, a private practice law firm. And prior to that, I spent a long time in-house, the last five years of that being with Canonical, which is one of Europe's biggest open source companies and the commercial sponsor of Ubuntu, the open source operating system. And um, when Jeff described open source to me as a tornado, it made perfect sense. It was a very steep learning curve as a lawyer moving into an open source company because there were so many different aspects to it. So the aim today is to reduce that down, to condense it into five key areas and five key ways to manage your risk by protecting your IP when you're dealing with open source software. And that's whether you happen to be a user or a distributor of open source. So the five key areas I'm going to touch on today are knowing what code you're using as a business, as a project, what code you're creating, and having an open source policy around that code usage and creation. Then managing your contributions to open source projects, making sure that your commercial models and contracts work with the open source software that you're using and distributing. And then just at the end, I'm going to touch on trademark usage and policies around open source and a little bit on patents. Patents, it's very much just skimming the surface because we could do a whole session just on that topic. So with audits and business policies, they're really the starting point to understand what code your business has, what's in your repositories, and what of that code is in fact open source. I'm not going to go into masses of depth, uh, depth on this because I'm hoping that at the end of my little presentation, Jeff will jump in. Uh, he has much more experience of audits than almost any of us, and hopefully he'll give us a bit more context and background on that. But from a lawyer's perspective, an audit is an essential first step in understanding what the software sitting in your repositories is and if it's open source. And when it happens to be open source, for you to understand when that was downloaded, how it got into your repositories, and what license it's under. 
for many different um, pieces of software, many packages, there may have been a license at one time, which is a different license now, or you might in fact find that there are two licenses that are current, and what license you are using the software on is important. It may have restrictions on commercial use, non-commercial use, the open source license may only be for particular types of usage. So you, you really do need to understand what the software you're using is, what the licenses are, and then how the pieces of code interact with each other, and whether those licenses work together. Um, a natural consequence of understanding what your code base is, is of course thinking what your business policy should be, and understanding why you're using that open source software, how you want to use it, and what the practicalities and the good housekeeping and compliance that sits underneath that usage will be. And in talking about this, I've almost assumed too much. I've almost jumped a step too far. So it's worthwhile just going backwards a little bit and understanding what exactly this free or open source software is. What is it that's open source? So on your screen now, you should be able to see some code. Now that's the kind of code that can be understood by a human. That's source code. Many of us work for years with software and never really understand what the code itself is. And that code is, is written by a human being that can be modified by a human being, understood by a human being who speaks the language, whether the language is Perl, Ruby, Java. It's a bit like speaking French, German, or Spanish. So long as you understand the language, you'll know what it says. Now, that's quite different from this. And this is binary object code, computer-readable code. And I guess everybody on the call probably knows that the traditional proprietary model is simply to distribute this computer-readable binary code which a computer can understand. And if a human can't understand it, a human can't modify, support, maintain that code. And the proprietary model will then drive you back to the distributor, the originator of the code, to get updates, maintenance, and support from them, which may well come at a cost to you. Now, that can be quite different for open source, because if you can have this human-readable version, you can make modifications, you can support and maintain yourself. But open source isn't just about the technical meaning of code and the technical existence of code. It's a much bigger thing than that, and it's actually a social concept with very strong leadership. Now, I guess no slide deck on open source, or should I say free software, would be complete without a picture of Richard Stallman, the, the godfather of free software. And here's your picture. And you'll see from this quote that Stallman, the originator really of free software, the, the, the person who drove and led that initially, is very much about freedom. It's very much a social and political concept that he sees in the software that's being distributed. His goal was to make sure that the software was shared, and there, there was um, almost a restriction on being able to take that software back and proprietarize it. It wasn't possible. You were saved from yourself and the temptation to proprietarize software. And he's a very, very clever man, and he did that by creating a concept I'm sure you've all heard of, copyleft. Now, copyleft isn't set up in statute. It doesn't have a, an official legal meaning that's been given by the legislators and the courts. But it does have a meaning that's generally accepted. And you'll see from the, the logo, the copyleft logo, it's a mirror image, a play on copyright. And what copyleft does is it means that where you take code, the copyright belongs to the creator of the code, you have a right to use it under a license. If that license is a free license, which is a copyleft license, should you want to maintain the code by modifying it, should you want to develop the code further, you can do that. You can use the four freedoms that Stallman set out. But in doing that, when you make changes and distribute those changes, you must pass the modified, the developed code on, on the same license you were given it under. And that's the essence of copyleft. It has a cascading or waterfall effect. Now, I often use a food analogy here. When you take half a dozen eggs, crack them, beat them up, and make them into an omelette, you can't split them back out. If you fry six eggs separately, you can. It's the very simplest way I've ever found of explaining derivative works, and I'm sure American lawyers are going to shoot me down for putting it that way. But in essence, if you combine different bits of code, you create an omelette if you do it one way, and you create six fried eggs if you do it another. Now, that's sometimes 
called a viral effect when it's applied to copyleft. If you mix software together and that software has copyleft, effectively you may be modifying, you may be developing the software by the combination depending on how you do it. There are many technical ways of not doing it. But if you make that into a software omelette, as I would think of it, and you have a derivative work, then there is a risk that the copyleft license will pass through into non-copyleft code. And that's sometimes perhaps a little dramatically called a viral effect. And probably the most famous license is the GNU General Public License, which has copyleft. And um, it's very much of Stallman's creation. So copyleft licenses and knowing what code you've got on them is important. But not all free and open source licenses are copyleft. As a, a sort of natural consequence of free software and business reaction to it, a more business-like approach, a more business-friendly movement grew up in the States in the 90s through the Open Source Initiative, which, like Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation, approves open source licenses. Stallman and the FSF approve licenses that can be labeled free, and the OSI approves open source licenses. And the big difference was that the OSI approved permissive licenses, licenses like BSD and MIT, which are much simpler in some ways, and some could argue freer than the copyleft licenses. And a permissive license may be very short. It tends to be very simple. And really what it will do is have an attribution clause requiring the author to be identified, the author of the code. It may well have something saying that you can't suggest that that author is the same person who is the author of modified codes. So you mustn't attribute something to someone if they didn't actually develop it. There's likely to be an exclusion of warranty because generally free and open source software comes without warranty. But it may be as simple as that. There may not be much else in the license. And that may allow you to change the license if you redistribute, and in some cases even change it to a permissive license. Now, it's very important, as I, I, I've tried to show there, to understand what your code is, understand what licenses it's on, and know how you want to deal with it. Some business policies will have white lists of clauses of uh, licenses rather they prefer, and some might have black lists saying we don't want certain licenses, we don't like copyleft, so we don't want the GPL. And when you distribute code, if you are the creator of the code, you may well choose a license. But often when you create code as a business or an entity, you're contributing it to a third party's project. And when you do that, you also have to understand not only how that code is distributed, but how it goes from you as an individual or business into the project. And that can be done in a number of ways. That can be done through a contribution agreement, of which there are many and varied. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved with this uh, project, Harmony, which was an attempt to standardize CLAs and uh, copyright assignment agreements. Uh, I don't really know how much take up there's been, but what I can say is there's still a lot of proliferation, a lot of different contribution agreements in the marketplace. Some projects don't use contribution agreements, they rely on their internal governance or uh, something called a DCO, a Developer Certificate of Originality. Or may, in fact, if they use a license such as the GPL for the outbound, simply require that contributions are made under that license. But it's important for you to understand what way you are contributing and what liabilities and risks your company is taking on in making those contributions. So these, these agreements do need reviewed. Some of them have indemnities and warranties that are quite strict. So I think we've covered, in the time we've got, how software is created, licensed, distributed, taken into projects. But actually then, if you're a business and you're using or distributing open source, how do your commercial contracts interface with those licenses? And it's worth just thinking a little bit about the commercial models that tend to surround free and open source software. So the traditional models that you've probably seen quite a lot of are add-on services, such as engineering services, customization of vanilla open source products to make them specific to your business or add a flavor to them, server and cloud, where the, the free and open source software is used in the back end and services are sold on the front end, SI, system integrators, who will often bundle free and open source software as part of their service offering. And then a sort of very popular distribution with the subscription model, like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where the distribution itself is free, but updates and maintenance are paid for. 
it's quite important to think about how the software has been brought into your business when you're considering those contracts and models. Um, in a traditional proprietary distribution, you will have an agreement that's very much about distributing software, granting a license, providing maintenance. Uh, you might have things like escrow. It's very much about the software, but it might be quite different from that in an open source agreement. If you've already got the software under a free or open source license downloaded from a repository, your agreement, your commercial agreement, might not be about software at all. It could purely be a service agreement. And I, I've seen many negotiations go wrong where lawyers on different sides don't fully understand that. And the clauses needed and the IP protection needed in agreements that are for services and for software itself are quite, quite different. Warranties, indemnities, liabilities and risk are all going to be very different. So the first and most important thing is to really understand what the agreement's for. If you're then dealing with an agreement that is for software or for free and open software, don't expect to get the same levels of reassurance, warranties, liabilities that you would have with proprietary software. You're not paying a royalty or a license fee in the main and you're very unlikely to get it. And also remember that there's no need to put a license into the commercial agreement itself if the software is already distributed on its own license. And just a warning, if you do put one in, be very careful that you're not adding extra provisions to the open source licenses as that's not possible for some of them. More recently, you may well as the business have come across co-opetition. Um, very innovative, very forward thinking where multiple companies, often potential competitors, come together, invest their R&D budgets collectively to develop to a standard or a platform that's going to be used across their business sector and then differentiate themselves at a higher level up the chain uh, from the main collaborative project. And those are increasingly common. I think they're very much of the future. Uh, it's a few years since I saw the first set of agreements around those, but there will be some sort of legal structure for that co-opetition, and it's important to make sure that you understand the membership agreements if you're becoming part of one of those contribution agreements and the IP policies, because all of the collaborators will ultimately need to use the IP. And this is just a link to a document that I worked on with a couple of other lawyers. It sets out the sort of things you'll see in commercial contracts around software, looks at them from an open or free and proprietary perspective, looks at them from the two sides, the, the vendor and the recipient, or the distributor and the recipient, I should perhaps say, and gives you some balance as to what's fair and reasonable. So that's under Creative Commons. Please feel free to help yourself and use it. So coming to the, the last two of my five topics, um, trademarks. As lawyers or even business people, we very much understand that a trademark is a sort of badge of origin, a certificate of where something comes from. It's a quality mark for most businesses. And when you distribute open source software, which is possible for third parties to modify, you really have to think about what the trademark implications of that are. It's very unlikely that you're going to want someone else to change software you have distributed with your branding on it and allow them to pass it on or at least distribute, uh, sorry, modify it significantly. And that's really worth thinking about and most big open source companies already have. So if you're using free and open source software that is branded, you may well find that if you want to modify it or use the trademark um, commercially that you need to get some rights. Most free and open source licenses don't cover that off and in some cases you'll see that not only is it not part of the software license but it's specifically called out as it is in GPLv3 that you can add trademark provisions without breaching the free and open source license. So I would suggest that you look carefully at the trademark policies of companies whose software you're using and if you're going to distribute your own software on a branded basis, think about how much change you're willing to allow before you want your branding taken off it. There may also be things like design rights, uh, design registrations and icons that should be covered in those policies. And I would say that Mozilla has a very good um, example of a trademark policy. There are many out there, I just happen to know that one quite well, uh, particularly around Firefox OS. And that will show you what can and can't be changed without having to remove the branding. So it's good guidance. There are others. And finally, patents. Patents are always a controversial area, um, particularly around open source, where many people 
in developing in that world don't agree with the existence of software patents. But I'm not going to get into all of that today. What I am going to say is that some licenses explicitly grant a patent license from anyone distributing the software under that license. So you have to think about how that's going to impact patents if you have them in the specific areas. So if the, the patents you hold read on the technology you're distributing the software for. And um, it's worth thinking about what licenses you use, whether that should be built into your policies, and then whether or not you're distributing, because that impacts it a great deal. If you are going to be involved in the open source and patents are a concern to you, then there are defensive organizations like the Open Invention Network, a defensive patent pool that you can take a free license for, which will help you to manage your risk. It has a cross-licensing agreement with over 1,100 other companies. There are other collaborative um, initiatives within Green Open Source, such as LOT, which uh, I believe Google invented, license on transfer, where when patents that are transferred out of their portfolio are relevant, they will have an encumbrance, which will be a license that carries with the patent, ideally, which will stop uh, third parties who acquire a patent from uh, using that patent to enforce it against open source. That's a, a very simplistic way of explaining some of this, but patents are very, very relevant and probably if you really are interested in that, something that, that is worth a whole webinar on its own. So Jeff, I, I've covered my five key elements that I, I think are worth considering to protect your IP in the open source tornado. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about audits? Yes, I will. I will. Thank you very much, Amanda. I really appreciate that. And um, let me see, Stacy, uh, can you make me the presenter? And I have some slides to, to push sure, forward no, here. No problem. I'll do that right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. And, and if anyone had any questions about Amanda's presentation, please feel free to um, ask the questions on the right-hand side in the chat window. And you'll see a, 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 a small space to type there. <coughs> okay. So Amanda laid a really good presentation on uh, groundwork on what is open source. A little bit about the history. Why, why are we why are we interested in this? What what is this thing at its very basics? Uh, what I would like to talk about now is how this what does this you know, why do we care? You know, it's, it's nice that this thing exists. It's nice that there's this philosophy out in the open source world about sharing and obligations. But how does that affect? You? How does it affect your technology company or your company in general if you're using um, source code? Uh, it's been said in the last couple of years that everything is driven by uh, software now. You know, if you are a restaurant, if you are an airplane manufacturer, if you are a um, just a social organization, you you have custom software written for you, and and we have to we have to give credit where credit's due. So what I'll talk about in our remaining time today is is about why we audit source code. And what we see, kind of when when we work with companies, what what does a typical company look like? What are the what are the problems that they have? Maybe the mistakes that they've made, and then how they how they can address it. So let's first talk about why do we audit source code in the first place? Why why should you, either as a as a, as a, a legal professional or as a technology professional or a developer or a VP of engineering, whatever, whatever you may be, if you have a role in your company in terms of trying to minimize risk or trying to do the right thing, this is where you start to think about auditing your code base. And what this basically means is working with your development team, the people who are writing software, whether they're an inside team or it's maybe you've had a consultant or an outside team write the software for you, and ask them questions about where did they get the code from? What what are they using? And what what's very eye-opening for, for Palomitas customers and people we work with in the industry is that most teams, most development teams, only know less than 25% of the open source code that they're actually using. And, and, and when we actually do the real numbers, the real census, it's typical that a developer is aware of 0% of the open source code or 1% basically very, very low understanding of what other people's code they have used in their own application. 
Uh, if you ask them what 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 open source, what commercial code are you using, they get a list of one item, five items, ten items. When we come in and, and Palomita does a review of that code base, we typically are going to find anywhere from ten to a hundred times more more open source, more libraries than they were aware of. Uh, the 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 bar chart you see on the left-hand side is part of our census that we do every year, where orange is undisclosed items that Palomita found on an audit, while blue is the number of libraries that the team was aware of before we did the review. And you'll see that most technology companies have very low understanding of what they're using. And each one of those libraries that they're using is potentially a reason why they cannot legally ship their software. Each of these libraries have obligations, as Amanda spoke of, things that you have to do in order to use the, the library. We're all very familiar with the commercial world, where uh, if you want to use a library, you pay somebody money. That's a very simple, simple obligation. The open source world has different obligations. They might not be asking for money, but they may be asking for credit. They may be asking for sharing of software their sharing of source code, whether it's just your changes or your entire application. They may be asking to share some patent rights. These are all obligations that are just as important as paying the, the, the financial cost. Uh, they're just as enforceable. They're just as concerning, though the vast majority of people in the industry are ignoring them right now. They're not getting in people in trouble, but it's also, it's also just not, um, it's, it's just not playing by the rules. So what what are people concerned about? Well, first off, they don't know what they're shipping. And this has concerns for legal obligations, and especially more and more now has concerns about uh, security implications. Teams are, are concerned about the general public license and other viral licenses. Uh, there's a term copyleft or viral that, that's often used, meaning the expectation is if you ship your software and you are using code under these licenses, like the general public license, you are expected to be giving all your code away that links to that library to whoever you give the code to, you give your application to. Um, that is the obligation of the license. If you don't like that obligation, don't use somebody else, that, that person's code. Well, it's very common for developers to not understand that. So very often, Palomita gets brought in to look for GPL code, places that that the company doesn't want it to be, or other similar licenses. There's a new license that's out there that's called the Afero GPL, which is an even stronger license, which says if you are using a library or code under the Afero GPL license, even if you're not shipping it, if, as long as you are providing network access, you, know, you are a website, you are a, a web application, um, that is seen as, as is basically a distribution, and you're expected to give all the source code for that entire application away as well, even just by providing network access. Another thing that we talk about is commercial content. Just like people are not keeping track of their open source libraries, they're not keeping track of their commercial libraries as well. And this is often a very big surprise when it comes time to settle up financial terms. And they find out that they've been shipping thousands or hundreds of thousands, or in some cases millions of copies of somebody's commercial library. And it's now out in the field. Uh, there's a huge installed base. And the, that company comes around saying, we, you know, we've noticed you've, you've shipped a million copies of our software. You really don't have a good uh, negotiation position there to, to negotiate with that commercial company if you've already shipped their software without permission. Uh, probably most of the people on the phone today have heard about the vulnerabilities that got a lot of press this year. Uh, Heartbleed was a very famous one was involving the uh, OpenSSL library. There's also the shell shock vulnerability that, that has received a lot of uh, publicity as well. These are very, very common and very serious issues. And most of the companies that were affected by them had no clue that they were using these libraries. They, 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 just, they, they showed up nowhere in their engineering documentation. They uh, did not they were not fulfilling the obligations on the open source licenses, and they had no clue that they were using it. Uh, there was a lot of people who were asked by their CEO saying, are we using OpenSSL? And if so, where? And they couldn't answer that question. And our phone started ringing off the hook a couple of days after that, when people suddenly realized what little knowledge they had 
of their open of, of their use of open source, the use of commercial code. This this is comes to the heart of why do we audit? If somebody calls you up and says, "Are you using OpenSSL?" It should be very easy for you to say yes or no. And yes, we are in these particular versions of our product. What what these two serious vulnerabilities showed companies is that they didn't have this visibility that they thought they did into their use of open source. That's exactly where Palomita comes in. That's exactly where your own internal due diligence, your internal training should come to play. Uh, I'm always surprised when, when we get a, a project that has absolutely no knowledge of their own open source usage. When I just open up the open up the code base and I see copyright after copyright or text file after text file with licenses, that's something that your team should have the ability and understanding to do. That comes by training, it comes by experience, but also frankly it comes by you, you telling the team that it's a requirement that they need to do, start educating themselves about open source and open source licensing. That the expectation is that they're going to do a better job about tracking this. Um, there's, a, there's a long laundry list of other things that people are concerned about here, but basically what, what it comes down to is when you use somebody else's code, they're going to put obligations on you. And those obligations may be financial, or they may be something more about giving credit or giving code or giving patents. You should just be very aware of what those obligations are. Uh, you may have some legal obligations as well from your government. So cryptography is a thing that is very common, that governments around the world restrict the use of cryptography at all or restrict the strength of the cryptographic libraries that are in play. And just like open source, companies have very little visibility to their use of cryptographic libraries. They don't know what these things are coming with. They're often hidden inside of, inside of other libraries. And when you, you start to distribute your product around the world, you need to sign, most governments require you to sign a document saying here's the cryptography in our products and we swear that this is true. If, if you only are aware of 1% of your use of open source, there's no way that you can be honestly signing that document in good faith to say you know where all the cryptography is. Again, that's another reason that people will, will start these types of processes, start doing reviews, start doing audits, is when they, when they come to this realization of that, how little visibility they have. Another interesting thing these days is about your suppliers. So if you're if you're coming from a large organization that has commercial suppliers from around the world or just commercial suppliers in general, if they are giving you software, if they are giving you libraries that they have either you've purchased in an, as an OEM or that they've done as a work for hire for you, if they are not providing a bill of materials of their use of open source, uh, you should be suspicious. Any software product of any complexity beyond you know tens of thousands of lines of code, which is a very small product, any product that has tens of thousands or more lines of code almost certainly has dependencies on somebody else's code as well. And if you are having code written for you by a commercial supplier and they are not providing an open source disclosure to you, you can rest assured that they are you're inheriting somebody else's problem. And, and this is becoming more and more important because We've seen some legal cases, we've seen some security cases where, as we say, suppliers to your suppliers are your supplier. Basically, if, if you look back in time, the applications that are being written for you, written for your suppliers, if you do the final distribution, when you ship your product, you are responsible for everything that goes out the door. I often use an analogy, like a, if you make a, a pill or a medicine, if you ship that medicine, you ship that pill, and it turns out that it doesn't have the right ingredients in it. You can't point back to your supplier and say, well, our supplier gave us sugar instead of aspirin. Uh, there are expectations on you that you're going to do testing, that you're going to do validation, that you're going to work with your suppliers to make sure that they have control over their supply chain. And software is getting to be a very similar place. The expectations uh, from the legal world are that if something goes out the door, you are required for, uh, for respecting those obligations. There's been some recent court cases that have shown that in Germany and are starting to show that around the world. So how is this product process implemented? Obviously at Palomita, we, we, we feel you should be using the Palomita software and Palomita services, but in general, as you start to roll these things out, there's, a, there's, there's some commonalities that you can do as, as, as you start to educate yourself, as you start to do paper procedures, as you start to do uh, telephone procedures and email procedures, 
the main idea here is that it's the get clean, stay clean policy. When you start first looking at all the work that you've done for the last one year, five years, 20 years, whatever it may be, you know that there are things, mistakes that basically have been made over the last one, two, five, 20 years. That, that is your get clean process. The idea is figure out what are you shipping, where's it gone to, what, what things do you need to start to unroll, what, what commercial licenses do you need to pay for, et cetera, et cetera. That very often is the, the, is the long pole in the tent. Uh, it's, it's a decent amount of work. It very often is a place where people bring in somebody like Palomita to do professional services around, bring in the experts who, who can help you figure out what, what you've been shipping and where it, what, what's in it. It, it's really where you, you start to figure out what are the types of libraries you're using, the types of licenses you're using, and it can really help you set your policy. So people very often will set their policy first. They'll say something like, no general public license, no this, no that. We, we really like MIT. We really like Apache. And they, then they do their audit, and they, they see that there are some places where they happily are able to use the general public license. Linux, for example, is under the general public license. Everybody loves Linux. Everybody is shipping embedded devices with Linux. You just have to know what is okay for your business model. What are things that you're going to give away for free? That's all the way this, all the source code for. What are things that you want to keep proprietary if, that, if that's your business model? So, getting clean and setting policy are very much linked together. And if you set policy, and then you start doing reviews, for sure you are going to modify your policy as you learn more and more about your use of open source and you learn more and more about your, your business model. And then once you, once you get, get clean, the idea is staying clean. Uh, the reason I started Palomita about 10 years ago is I just saw the difficulties that development teams were having trying to keep track of everything that was coming in from the internet. It's very easy for your developers just to type something into a search engine, find some source code or find a binary library, download it, and start using it. Your developer's job is to traditionally is seen as getting products out the door as quickly as possible. Everybody's under deadline. Everybody's missing their deadline. Uh, so we, our job here is to try to make the stay clean process as easy as possible. A big part of that is education. If your developers keep making the same mistakes, all the software in the world is not going to help you. All the auditing in the world is not going to help you. You need to, you need to basically prevent your developers from making kind of the silly mistakes. So we really suggest a good education process, like the webinar today. If your developers have not had an introduction to open source, if they don't have a cheat sheet or a, a set of guidelines from you, um, th there's no way they can make the right choice. So roll out an education process. Start giving them, as part of your onboarding, when you, when you hire them, make sure that they understand your policies around open once a year, just like you're probably doing with other types of training, like ethics training or harassment training, things like that. Make sure that everyone in your company is brought up to date with your current standards. It doesn't have to be eight hours of training, but even 15 minutes or half an hour, an hour, that says we consider that this is very important for us. We need to do the right thing. Here's what our expectations for you are. Really can help you keep your code base really clean and, and, and allow you to use open source without being somebody who uses open source without doing the right thing. A brief history of open source licensing here. Um, I, I think that the, the main takeaway from this is, is open source has been with us for a very, very long time. But it really has exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we've seen uh, in the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the explosion of Linux, the explosion of uh, organizations like GitHub, which make it very easy to share source code. Uh, there are now on GitHub over 10 million open source projects. Many, many of those are duplicates, but nonetheless, there's 10 million places where your developers can go out and download something. And that's just on GitHub alone. Every other website in the world has source code on it. And very often what you see from developer behavior is they go and they type, uh, give me client server example. Or give me uh, give me a oops, get a little cross talk there. Sorry. Um, so it's very easy for your developers to get the code, and that is how people are are basically writing software today. Uh, what we see is that about fifty percent of your application is likely open source or third party software. 
And that's a very surprising number to, to most people. Uh, when we ask companies what percentage of their application do they think they own, we, we often hear 90%, 99%, 100% of this application is ours. When we finish our reviews, and when people use our software, they use our services, they find out they're about 50% open source or commercial code. And that's, that's very shocking to them because first off, they did they, they thought they thought they, they they wrote a lot more than they did. They also are shocked that they see hundreds of of open source libraries that they didn't even know they were using. They weren't respecting the licenses. They weren't respecting the the, the basically the patches and the vulnerabilities that are coming out of these these libraries as time goes on. And they they said, well how did we get to this place? Well first off they got this place because developers have a different understanding of licensing than, than let's call it reality. Uh, the typical developer just goes out to the internet, types something into a search engine, finds the answer, and uses it with a very you know very quick, very quick looking. You say, hey, is it easy to use? Is it is it is it something that's in the right language? Can I easily get it and integrate it with my product? If the answer is yes, 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 guess what? You're shipping it. Uh, there is not a lot of, of understanding of licensing by the line level developer, and there's a misunderstanding of licensing. So the typical developer has a misunderstanding that if, if it's on the internet, they can use it. It's free. Um, unlike what we, 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 we know, which is if, if you don't have explicit permission to use something, you can't use it. And that if you talk, go talk to your average developer, you're going you're gonna to hear a misunderstanding, which is, well, it was on the internet. I thought it was free. So it's, it's really important to explain to them why you need a license. Uh, this is one of the biggest pieces of education that we see is important with onboarding your developers. Simply can be a piece of paper. Simply can be a PowerPoint slide, much like this one. You need to have a license to use somebody else's code. Uh, you don't have any right to use it without their permission. Um, so open source commercial licenses are the main way of giving permission to use source code. So a commercial license says, yeah, you can use our code if you pay us money. The open source licenses say, you can use my code without having to call me up on the phone or sending me an email as long as you do A, B, C, and D. That's the open source obligation. And if, you can, if you're not willing to respect those obligations, don't use my library. Go someplace else. Well, developers haven't been following this process. And um, very often we'll go pick some code that doesn't even have an open source license. They, they type in something into the internet, they find some code, it works for them, they use it. We then go look at that project. There's no permissions for other people to use it. There's no contact information, et cetera. That's code that you really don't have permission to use. So what we always say is you do not have open source if you don't have a license. Maybe we can use a term like visible source or something like that, but it's not open source. If you don't know what the permissions are. And probably about 10% of your code base is going to be code that came from the internet that has no open source, no commercial license associated with it, which means you have no permission to use the code. And again, that's a very eye-opening thing for people as they start to look at the code that they're using. Um, historically, 10 to 20% of the libraries we see in a, a large commercial product are going to lack licenses. Uh, and it has been increasing. As we see more and more people writing blogs, as we see more and more people uh, putting up quick quick home pages saying, hey, here's some code that, that I found useful. Uh, a lot of the JavaScript world, or the web web world, just don't have licenses. They, they, a lot of people have just been pushing out small, small libraries, small chunks of code without thinking about the license. And as we say, the smaller or newer project is, the less likely it is to have an explicit license. And there's a lot of unused libraries that have no licenses. I Meaning the developer put it up there, but nobody's ever used it, nobody ever has asked any questions about it. And and your developer might find it and say, oh, this is perfect for just what we need, and download and grab it, thinking that it's on the internet. So so what's happening? What what's going on in the open source world that causes this? Well, there, there is a large lack of knowledge of open source best practices in the development community. This means both internally at the your companies, as well as the same people are writing open source code as well. So if you don't understand licensing, but you do understand programming, that's a perfect storm for saying, I put something on my blog that may be useful to other people, but you don't make it clear what the permissions are. You might be somebody who really believes in viral copyleft licensing. 
You may be a person who believes very much in public domain licensing, but nobody else knows unless that is explicitly written down. Um, universities are not teaching new developers about open source licensing. It's, it's always ironic that if you go through four or five years of, of engineering school, computer science school, and you don't learn about open source licensing at all, you don't learn about trademarks or patents, and the first thing you do when you graduate is you're asked to sign a patent agreement. You're asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And then you're given the keys to the source code management system and access to the internet. And you are 21, 22 years old, and you haven't had any experience with this, but you're starting to make very important intellectual property decisions for a large company. So again, it's very important to start training your developers about the expectations. Um, one thing we've seen recently is that GitHub has made it it's a very large, very great site for sharing source code, sharing source code projects, project posting. One of the problems was for a long time, they didn't make it very clear that you, you should pick a license. And some research showed that something like 85% of the libraries that were hosted on GitHub did not have clear licensing that made it very easy for your developers to understand what was going on. Um, GitHub has been changing that over the last year, which is really good to see, but there is still an, a very large installed base of, of a project there that the original developers did not make it clear licensing. And even the newer newer projects, it's not always clear what the licensing is for, for those work. So when you talk with your developers, always ask them questions. What library are you using? What license? How do we know? Uh, those are things that if they, they can't answer instantly, it means they probably haven't paid attention to it when they picked the library. And and one of the last slides here is about the common misunderstanding. Um, and, and this is something that is a perfect slide to work with your developers if you haven't done this already, is, is to walk through things that developers believe that aren't true. The first one is just because code is available, um, people believe that they have the right to use it. That's not true. If the code is just because the code is available, it doesn't give you any permission to use it. Uh, you need to have explicit permission. The freely available is not equal to open source. And public domain is different than open source. We, we very often hear people use the term public domain almost like magic words. Uh, the definition of public domain is very strong. It means that there is no license, there is no obligation on the code. But very often developers use the term public domain when they're talking about open source in general. So we will see people say, oh yeah, it's public domain, it's Linux. When Linux is not public domain, it's under a very strong license. So um, when you hear certain terms like open source and public domain, there, is, there are real definitions and then there's the common definition. And you should be aware that just because somebody is using some terms that you, you think you understand, that sometimes, especially in the development world, you should, you should uh, um, ask two or three questions around that just to make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, some people say, well, we don't ship our product. We're a hosted site or we, we, uh, we only use it internally. Well, it's not that you're safe in that case. It means you have perhaps less, less obligations under some of these open source licenses, but there are still things that you need to worry about. You need to worry about vulnerabilities. You need to worry about commercial licenses. You know, I always, I always joke that Oracle, for example, they don't care whether you're shipping or not shipping your product. They're use, if you're using their database, they expect you to pay. And that's true of all commercial organizations. Uh, you also may have a web, a web tier be a lot of JavaScript there that may have some licensing or your use of a Faro license component. So just because you're not shipping a product, there are still some things that you should be aware of. And sometimes we, we see people send, send some notes over to the open source author, and they never get a reply, and they get upset about that. Well, you know, we don't, let's all have to remember that the, the open source author does not owe us anything, it doesn't owe us a reply, doesn't owe us any features. Um, open source has now been long enough, around long enough, 20, 30 years, that we actually see sometimes that the authors are actually dead or that they no longer have access to that email. Uh, so it, it's not a surprise if you don't hear an answer back. And that may be a sign that you shouldn't be using that library in the first place. If you're not going to get a reply from the author, that, that's a sign that they're perhaps not paying attention to this library anymore. They may have security issues. And also bear in mind that the author, just because they're an open source developer, does not make them an expert open source license. It, it's very common that the, the author is a great programmer, but they really haven't had any education or knowledge about open source licensing. 
and you'll see some very strange things, or you'll hear, you'll hear folklore from them around the license. Okay. So in terms of, of, of what you what you would do, you're going to start looking for open source, you're going to start looking for commercial code, and then you, you're going to perform an audit, whether you do it internally, whether you pull in somebody like Palomita to do professional services. One way or another, you're going to go from very low knowledge to much higher knowledge of what's going on. And guess what? You're going to find code that you shouldn't be able to use, you shouldn't use. 10, 20, 30, 40 percent sometimes of people's libraries, people's, people's code bases are, are have licenses that you're not going to be able to respect. And those are cases where you need to make some changes. So first one is, what do you do if you find a library that you can't use? Well, the first option is remove it and rewrite it. So you might just simply delete that code, delete that code and then have your development team re-implement the feature. You know, if, you, if you find a library that's, say, commercial or GPL, it turns out that you can't afford to pay the money there or you can't, you can't respect the general public license terms. Very common people say, we're going to delete this feature, delete this library, and re-implement it in a, in a clean room environment. Um, this is very common during merger and acquisition work, where a company is buying another company, they find a whole bunch of problems, and they say, go just delete it and make, make the product work again. Um, it's also very common for risk-averse organizations who look at this, and say, we've got a problem here, we're just going to delete it, we're going to fix it, fix it on our timeline, and fix it. You know, there's some drawbacks here. First one, it takes time to do a rewrite. You very often what, what I call dirty room re-implementations, where the developer takes that code and uh, they've been asked to fix it, and what they really just do is they just change the original code enough that it looks different. Um, that's not that 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 looks really bad if you get caught doing that. Um, and then sometimes the developers go out and they download something new, and the new new version of the, of the library they download doesn't have a banner license. You know, maybe you were told, oh, go get rid of this license that's a little too strong for us. Well, they might come back with an even stronger license for some new library if they haven't been educated about what they're expecting. Uh, number two is sometimes you can go reach out and ask, contact the original author and ask for another license for us. So if there's no license or maybe a strong license, uh, it's very common for people to say, can I use this under BSD license or an MIT license? Um, there are some risks there. Uh, author might now know you're using their library, something that you've been using for years. That might not be good for you. Um, the uh, author may require a commercial license that you don't want to pay for, and so on and so on. So this is a really good option for cases where you're making your original license choice. Um, you, uh, you know, if, you, if you could either take or leave the library, great time to ask the author. Say, hey, can I use this under MIT? It, it's a good suggestion to give them an option, say, we really like the MIT license. Otherwise, I might pick a really strong license. Um, this, is a, this is a great way to start when you're, you're picking the libraries for the first time. Sometimes it works if you've had an install base, but people sometimes shy away from that. And then lastly here is sometimes people just wait and see. Let's see if, let's see if somebody comes out of the woodwork and, and yells at us. Um, uh, keep shipping the software. It's very common for very old code, maybe code from the 1980s, 1990s that you find. Um, it's sometimes common for risk tolerant organizations. You know, there's a pretty serious risk here, which is copyright infringement. If you keep using the software, you know you're not allowed to use. Um, you may have a license problem, of course, to comply, and you obviously can't properly disclose all your open source licenses, which is something more and more we're seeing people required to do. So. Um, that is that is kind of basically our presentation today about what what you can do about auditing, what you can do about uh, educating your customers uh, and your as well as your your developers. Um, you you should expect more and more that as you sign agreements with your customers that there's going to be a term in there that says we expect a full open source disclosure. Um, most companies right now, when they sign that, they think they think that they already have that information. And it's been my experience that the information that people have is nowhere near appropriate, nowhere near the full playlist. So keep that in mind as you look at your agreement, and uh, we will. Uh, uh, we're here to help. If you have any questions? As well. And I do see there's a couple questions here on the on the chat room. So I'm going to I'm going to walk through a couple of them before we drop today. Yeah. Just before you do, I, I'd like yeah. to pick up a thing quickly. One of the yeah. things that you really flagged there in your talk, and I'm not sure how aware you were of it, is 
the international nature of the licenses and the development community and how um, IP licensing has lots of different meanings in different countries. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I've been very frustrated over the years <laughs> by the term public domain. because It doesn't have a meaning with regard to software at all in the UK. So when developers have tried to say to me, yeah, it's great, it's fine, use it, it's in the public domain, it's caused me a lot of problems. Um, and we, we have looked a bit at orphaned works in the UK recently, but we just don't have rights to use software that's licensed in that way. So I've always very much tried to drive people away from picking, li uh, picking software without licenses. And what GitHub have done recently is a great step forward. And I, I think a second thing that you raised there was the great urban myth of the developer. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very hard to persuade the development community um, developers in your commercial organization that something isn't true. Generally, mm -hmm. the IANAL, I am not a lawyer, but and yeah. the was strongly held in the development community, which you as a lawyer will find it very hard to dispel if that whole community has got it from a, a blog or a, a source that they regard as gospel, even if it's legally incorrect. Yeah, and that's a very, very good point, Amanda, which is you are going to find people who have very strong folklore, and since they are very, they're great developers, there's often a bit of an aura around them as well. As well, if they're so smart about programming, they must really understand this this program-related legal document. And um, as a as a as a counsel, as a legal person here, or as a manager there, it is really important to, you know, to trust your people, but also verify. And especially if something that seems really strange, I, I, I see this happen all the time where a developer says, "I've read the GPL, and they can't enforce it," and X Y Z, and you find yourself making choices that the rest of the development community would not make, the rest of the legal community would not make. So if you do find yourself just being a bit of an outlier when it comes to interpreting things like the GPL or other open source licenses, that's not a, not, not a good place to be. Um, it is a, it is a, 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 you have to depend not just on your interpretation of the licensing, but also the original author's interpretation of licensing. If, you, you, if you're too far away from their interpretation, you're going to have a problem. You, now, quote unquote, even if you're right, you're going to have a problem if there's a, uh, a disagreement with the original author. And and do do respect, as Amanda said, the, the worldwide development community. You're going to have people in India, China, Eastern Europe, uh, Europe, U.S., South America, all with different languages, all with different understandings. It's really good to understand, especially uh, places like China, places like Brazil. Um, there's not a lot of English. Uh, uh, Portuguese and Chinese discussion about open source licensing right now. And you, you should just assume that there's going to be a lot more folklore and misunderstandings in places like China and Brazil than you might have, say, in, in London or the US. Um, I, I see another, uh, there was basically a question here from the audience, which is, will electronic copies of the slides be available? And yes, the answer is yes, and we'll, we'll make those available for the people who join us. Any other any other questions before we drop? We're coming on the the, the, the bottom of the hour here. Uh, let's give everybody maybe ten more seconds to type a question here. Jeff, if you don't mind, okay. I see a couple that I could add. Um, yeah, please. So uh, the first one is: Do you often find open source projects containing several licenses? For example, Project X under BSD three clause containing single files under GPL. So, the, so do we see really complex open source libraries that sometimes have their own open source problems? And the answer is yes, all the time. Uh, different organizations will have better cleanliness. So that's the reason why people say go to the Apache Software Foundation, is because they do really good vetting of their libraries before they ship them. If you get something from a single person, maybe from you don't even know their full name, that may be a sign that there, there's not a clear uh, legal trail there. And it is very common for us to see problems where different, you know, stronger licenses are seen inside than on the outside of the package. That's something we call the envelope problem. That the outside of the envelope says something is nice and, and, and permissive, and inside the envelope there's all sorts of other problems. Good question. Thank you. Uh, another question that we have here is, uh, what is the vulnerability slash risk of using unlicensed code hosted in GitHub? So the unlisted, un, un, 
license code, whether it's GitHub or any place else, the, the risk there is if somebody comes out of the woodwork, you don't know what license terms they may put on you. Uh, you didn't have permission to use it in the first place, and if somebody starts, finds out that you're using it, they can always dictate whatever terms they want. They can say, oh, by the way, it's commercial. You owe me a million dollars. Or it's a Faro or GPL. You need to open up all your source code. You, you may not decide to do those operations, but you have then a, a, a legal disagreement, which can lead to a lawsuit. So the, the concern is you don't control you don't control your own destiny if you're using other people's code that you don't know what the license is. Jeff, it's, it's I like think it's science. Worth, yep. Sorry, Jeff. I think it's also worth pointing out there that lots of open source projects have more than one author. So even if somebody has, in good faith, put it up on GitHub or some other repository for you to use and said, help yourself, it may be that not everybody else who contributed to the code thinks the same way. And they also will have rights to enforce the copyright and the code they've created. So you really shouldn't be using code unless you have a license and know what rights you've got to use it and what obligations you have to comply with. Just as a full stop, I think. Exactly. That's a good point. That's kind of a nice segue to the next question, which is, uh, have you heard about open source trolls which contribute GPL code into open source projects? Mm -hmm. I, uh, this is Jeff here. I have not heard of an open source troll that is purposely trying to do that yet. Um, I have seen copyright trolls, so people who are, who are out in the, uh, the community at large looking for copyright violations. Um, where they, you know, they, 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 they're, they're enforcing, especially around multimedia images, songs, sounds, and things like that used by websites. But I have not seen anybody purposely try to say corrupt an open source library. You know, fr frank, frankly, there's just enough, there's just enough use of GPL code that didn't need to be, have a copyright troll behind it. You know, there's enough problems just from general use without we have to go out of their way and make a problem. I haven't seen it either. Uh, that's all the questions that I see here. Okay, well, I'd like to, this is Jeff Lush from Palomino. I really would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And Amanda, thank you very much for a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, both of these decks will be available to you. Uh, we'll, we'll post this on our website as well as uh, send out a link. And if you ha do have any questions, please feel free to follow up with either Amanda or ourselves. Uh, the Palomino contact information is up on the screen. Amanda's information is in her slide deck as well. And uh, you know, we, we look forward to hearing from you. And if you have any uh, feedback on the presentation today or requests for future webinars or presentations, please let us know. We, we, love, to, we love to put these things on, and we love to get the feedback from the audience. So uh, thank you. And Amanda, any, any um, things you'd like to say before we drop? Um, just thank you very much for inviting me along. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, very much. And we will talk to you in about a month or so. Thanks again.